Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 147th episode of OGC. My name is Jake Watson, your host, and we will be going over AIGA Brazil, as well as some tournaments and events coming up that I'm very excited to be a part of. I'll tell you guys a little bit about what's going on next month. And, uh, you know, just some of the things that I took away from my time in Brazil. So very excited. Welcome back to the Open Guardcast. So, welcome back. I'm finally back home in the United States from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, amazing time in Brazil. I haven't been there since I was 15 years old competing in the Brasileiros. Uh, oddly enough, fun story, Jonatas Gracie actually won my division all the way back then. I didn't even know him. No idea who he was. I had fought in Pan Ams in May of that year, which was 2013. Uh, I fought in Pan Ams. I won the Juvenile 1, I believe. I, I was Juvenile 1 back then. I won the Blue Belt Division. And in the final, I fought a guy named Victor Leal Antunes. And then I fight him in Brazil. So in the final of Pan Ams, I submit with an Oma Plata. I've only ever done that twice in my career, by the way. Uh, and then in the first match of Brasileiro, I fight him. And I'm like, all right, cool. I got this. I did this before. Let's go. And he beat me 20-0. to not fun. Uh, did not feel good about that. But anyway, uh, back in Brazil for the first time since then, uh, when I went the original time, I went to Rio de Janeiro, and then I went to Sao Paulo for the tournament, back to Rio for like one more day, and then to America. Today, This time, I flew in uh, first to, last time I flew into Texas, and then from Texas to Brazil. This time I flew to Canada, which I, you know, I thought maybe, you know, kind of a weird uh, directional change there five hours away from Brazil and then 10 hours to Brazil. Um, and I, and I talked to William Tackett on the way back home. They were flying straight into Houston. I'm like, why, why can't I do that? I want to fly in straight to America, but, uh, 20 hours of travel there, 20 hours of travel back. I get there immediately. Uh, I actually have a, uh, I made a friend uh, because he's fluently bilingual in English and Portuguese. He was on my flight. His name was Mauro and, uh, Mauro was, uh, just to, I think he was just a student and he was just traveling the world learning, which is pretty cool. But he helped me get around. Uh, I saw Victor Doria in the airport. Uh, one thing that I could take away is that I was able to talk to a lot of the locals, which I was very happy with. I was, I was definitely, I was comforted to know, okay, if I tell them my Portuguese is very basic and I tell them, hey, I'm learning, they speak to me like a kid, which I prefer. I'm not, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I need to be spoken to like a kid when I'm learning Portuguese for the first time. But it was very cool. People were very friendly. I didn't have any run-ins with any, you know, illegal activity or potential people trying to steal my stuff, which I know does happen. But that happens in places in America, too. Just don't brandish your phone at night, you know, when there's motorcycle drivers around, and you'll be fine. Um, make sure that, you know, you, you travel in groups at night, like stuff like that. Just simple, easy stuff that you should do anyway because people are people. Um, but overall, amazing experience. I was able to go to church Igreja Cidade Cinco, and uh, Marcelo, who I met, just invited me to his church. He was preaching that day, preached a great message, and I was able to make some friends down at that church in Brazil, and so now I have their WhatsApp, and you know we talk, and it's just very, very cool. I'm also going to be able to potentially be tutored in Portuguese, which is great for the development of my career as well, because I really value the ability to speak the native language of most of the competitors in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community, as well as a lot of the competitors in the other communities like MMA. Shoot, even Muay Thai has a lot of Brazilian competitors. So, uh, super happy about that. Now, uh, to Aiga. So, first of all, Aiga was a great experience. Those of you guys who watched on Flow Grappling probably noticed that there was a lot of technical issues. Uh, there was a lot that happened this week. Uh, and Aiga, the people who run Aiga are based out of Kazakhstan, and they worked with a Brazilian production company for the event. They don't usually do that. In Turkey, they had their people. That's why Turkey went off without a freaking hitch, because these guys are on it. They are locked in. And any of you guys who have seen the Aiga Champions League group stage from the last time where Team Adolfo won, you could see it, there's no problems. It is unreal how nice it is. It is insane. Uh, and Aiga has some really, really big plans, which I hope to be able to be a part of the uh, the movement sharing that moving forward because, oh my gosh, they have they have plans, guys. They have plans. But, uh, you know, the, the production issues, I imagine, were largely due to a lot of the language barrier between Kazakh and Portuguese, as well as, you know, not having a lot of people to translate, uh, shoot, things that weren't accounted for, things that, you know, I mean, when the show was supposed to start at 4 p.m., they didn't even finish putting the venue together until 5.45. 
you know, and, and, and not blaming anybody or, you know, pointing fingers or anything like that. But there was just some there were some issues. And Howell and I, uh, Howell Teague, by the way, shout out to Howell Teague. Uh, we really rolled with the punches. We were able to pretty much put together a impromptu, completely unrehearsed, completely unscripted pre-show for 35 minutes. We pretty much intelligently vamped for, for 35 minutes to try to make time and to build time. A lot of noise in the background, people walking in front of the camera. Everything that, every, every cardinal foul of broadcasting was committed in a single day. Let's just say that. Uh, but very, 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 very fun. And so it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, I left kind of feeling like, man, I can't wait for the next Aiga. Uh, the next Aiga will be in the United States of America. So stay tuned. Follow at Aiga.global on Instagram. Follow, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel most definitely because they're doing amazing things and they're great people. And I really, truly think that there are companies being made. There are companies being created that are going to change the sport of jiu-jitsu forever. And Aiga is one of them. So super excited about that. Now let's get into the performance of Team Kasai. So the winner of the Aiga Champions League Brazil qualifier was Team Kasai. CEO Rich Byrne of Kasai Grappling. He was the one who put the team together. The manager was Mateus Lutis. If you don't know Mateus Lutis, he is the Rottweiler. He is an amazing competitor. He recently made his return to competition as a black belt competing in the ADCC Opens. He won several. He... Uh, Man, he made it to the final of uh, the South Korean tournament that I'm forgetting. Uh, Ro it's not Royal. Royal is the name of his gym. I don't know why I'm forgetting um, the, the name of the tournament that I was in. It was in Seoul, South Korea. It was a really awesome tournament, but I, I don't know why I can't think of it off the top of my head. But he went out there. He had a great career at Brown Belt. 2018 Nogi World Champion in both his division and the Absolute as a, uh, a lightweight, I believe. He was a lightweight back then because I remember... No, he was a middleweight because I competed medium heavy. Yeah, he was a middleweight. Uh, but he, at Brown Belt, and he beat Victor Hugo in the final, comes back to competition. He's looking great. Uh, then they had, they also recruited the help of Pedro Mourinho's coach, Upiano, and also Victor Doria. So they had a lot of great minds there. But the team was primarily made up of under 60 kilogram division, Junior Casio. 65 kilogram division was. Uh, Dorian Oliveres, 70 kilogram was Fabricio Andre. Under 76 was Andrew Tackett, who dipped back and forth between under 76 and 83 kilogram. Under 83 kilogram was Sebastian Rodriguez. Uh, the second day, Hanato Canuto was the under 76 kilogram representative, and Andrew took Sebastian's spot. The under 91 was Pedro Mourinho, and the above 91 was Roberto Jimenez. That's a super team. Now, they went to work on day one. They really did. Day one and day two. And I have to get, I have right here a, a highlight from day one, just kind of showing you guys some of the stuff that went down. I mean, 21 fights, 20 submissions. That was, that was their record across Aiga for, because Aiga functions in sort of a team format. Uh, they had, it, it goes in the head to head. So each team will have their can weight divisions go head to head against each other. So, you know, Junior Ocasio would go against Guillermo Oliveira of another team, which have ended up being a matchup actually in the final. Uh, the, you know, Junior's not going to fight somebody in the under 76. They're going to fight in their respective weight divisions. The first to get four wins wins that round. Even if it's 4 0 and you still got three more fights to go because it's seven fights, you still. You still win, and you're still going to do those fights. So it could be four to three. You could lose those next three fights. It doesn't matter. You already won the round. So And it's random. It's a random selection. They draw a lot at the beginning to see what the order of fights is going to be. And uh, that's how it works. It's very, very fun. It's a cool team aspect of jiu-jitsu. I could see it turning into like, oh, my gosh, I have my, you know, my favorite athletes where you know, I wear their jersey, and I, I love Team Kasai. I'm rooting for Team Kasai next season. That's obviously in the future. Aiga has huge plans, and I'm very excited to hopefully be a part of them. But... You know, just just performance after performance of incredible work that was put together uh, by this team. I mean, this is actually from day two. I, I apologize. This is from this is from day two of competition, but this is the semifinal. So, and, and what you can see here is an absolutely incredible, incredible performance by everybody. Um, <clears throat> like I said, submissions across the board. Uh, I I could talk about it and I could do an in depth analysis on it. Um, but basically, each athlete pulled their weight. And that's why this is sort of a super team. People are saying that this team could even rival Team Adolfo, which I agree. I think that they definitely could. Um, and whether or not they will have a matchup with each other in the future remains to be seen. 
Uh, I think that there has been some interest expressed on both sides of just doing like maybe even a showcase matchup between them. That would be very cool. I would be very much looking forward to that. Uh, but let's run through it. Junior Ocasio, three fights, three submissions. Really showcases why he is a not only a leg lock expert, not only a real aficionado of the technical aspects of the leg entry game and the ins and outs and being comfortable. I mean, the Juni lock, uh, which he sent me videos like, hey, this is me setting up the Juni lock. He he allows his opponent to reap his knee all the way through so that he can heel hook that leg. Who thinks of that? Uh, they got Dorian Oliveros. ADCC 2023 East Coast Trials was definitely the breakout performance of that young star. But I would say that he is more in his breakout year after, Ka after Kasai. Uh, again, three fights. Three submissions against, I, I don't know the the belt level. I don't even know if you can even say that anymore, to be honest, because it feels like jiu-jitsu has just evolved so much to where, and not even jiu-jitsu itself, but the athletes have evolved so much, and the preparation and the teaching and the way that they're able to learn has gotten so much better to where it's like, I can't even say belt level anymore. But Dorian is a purple belt, right? And he goes out there. His wrestling's on point, of course. That was one of the trademark attributes that he came into the, at East Coast Trials with. But he comes in Aiga and submits all three opponents. And gets two, uh, Howell called it a seated karagatami. Uh, I, I guess I'll start calling it that. But it's the guillotine with the arm in, uh, in the in the fashion of an anaconda choke, which is kind of like an upside down arm triangle or karagatami. Uh, gets two of those, and I believe his third fight, he might have either got a rear naked choke or he got a kimura, but he's just, he looked incredible. Uh, he, he looked evolved. He looked comfortable. He looks more and more like a jujitsu athlete that really does have a high level passing game, high levels of endurance, and ideal wrestling uh, with every tournament that he enters in. So great work on him as well. Then we have Fabricio Andre. Fabricio Andre is a madman. That's what I think when I see him fight. This guy goes out there and it looks like he's, it almost looks like he's not taking it 100% seriously, I'll be honest, because he goes out there and it looks like he's always playing around. He's playing around like a serious way. His style's goofy, and it seems like he's almost constantly joking, and it keeps people on edge. It's it's very strange. And if you guys have seen him fight, I mean, even the way he prepares before his match, it's very like, it, it's very anime esque. And I feel like he kind of lives his life almost anime esque. I mean, there's there's behind the scenes videos of him screaming at the top of his lungs, dancing in the middle of fights, doing his crazy Fabricio Andre thing. It's just incredible. I mean, the guy is the guy is so fast. And then I think he lulls you into this almost sort of sing-songy sort of style jiu-jitsu. And then he want, one opening is all he needs, and he explodes into submissions like that. And he, I mean, he got some dynamic entries. Uh, he fought Mateus David Dos Santos, and, uh, or David Mateus Dos Santos, I believe is actually his name. And David was, I mean, he, he nobody could pass his guard. He fought Juan Alvarenga. Juan couldn't even do anything. It, it was... In, and Ruan passes a lot of people's guards. He really does. And David just had a very defensive guard, not a very offensive guard, but he was able to, Fabrizio was able to just seem like blow past it once he had the opportunity and log the submission. So Fabrizio, three fights, three submissions. So far, everybody. Then we have next, Andrew Tackett. What more can be said about the year that that guy's having? Uh, he just is so dynamic. He's equipped for every single match. It looks like he's really in his element right now. And uh, very excited to see what he does in the future. It's 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 really cool to see. Uh, Hanada Kanuto had two fights, but two submissions. It's nice to see him competing again. ADCC 2022 was the last time that we saw him when he was being really active in competition. Took some time off. Then he comes back. He competes at PGF World, UFC Fight Pass Invitational, Aiga. It's like, whoa, Hanada Kanuto's back, and he's back in a big way. And I'm really excited about that. Very excited to see him re-enter the competition scene. I'm excited to see what he's going to do next. He's so dynamic. He's fun to watch. The entire Kasai team really was a super team. Next is Sebastian Rodriguez. Sebastian most definitely pulled his weight. He had one fight uh, and one submission. And, you know, he's so fluid. He actually had a moment in his match, his, his exclusive match of the event, which he got up, he wrestled up in such a way that it almost had the energy of a sweep. It was just very fluid. Uh, didn't look like he exerted himself too much to get the job done. He went to the second round, but that first round was a lot of feeling out and, and feeling how the fight was going to go, and that was on day one. And he he looked he looked fantastic. He he looked very measured, very calm. I don't know if he got injured, and that's the reason why he didn't compete the second day or what. Who knows? 
Um, but moving on, under 91, Pedro Mourinho is an absolute menace to society. That guy's so strong. I think he broke his first opponent's back. Not sure. Uh, his, he got two guillotines as well, which I thought was hilarious because it's like we can't we can't keep letting him get away with it, right? He's he's just got this crazy lock on the guillotine that must be just bone crushing. I, I've shared the match with Pedro Mourinho on a couple of different occasions in the gi. Glad I didn't get caught in a guillotine because that would have sucked, and I don't want it to ever happen to me. So thankfully, I have not competed against him in a while. Uh, when I do return to competition, we'll see. I don't know. We might be in the same weight division. I'm not really sure anymore. I don't know. I don't know what my weight's supposed to be. But Pedro looked great. Uh, scarcely put in any sort of a rough situation. Just looked in control of every match that he had. Uh, which I mean is as per the usual. He's. I mean, the last time he was really put in a dangerous spot, I feel like in tournament was Gordon Ryan, and Gordon is Gordon. So, above 91, the above 91 kilogram division had Roberto Jimenez. Now, Roberto, it's funny, I mentioned it on the broadcast, Roberto has, yeah, people forget, I think, sometimes that Roberto was 77 kilos at ADCC 2022 Worlds. That's Cade Ruotolo's division. He was competing in the above 91 against people who were like 240 pounds. Antonio Asif was in the 91 kilo, the above 91 uh, Team Pedamaji, which actually fell to Team Voke Elite before the final. Team Pedamaji had Antonio Asif at 290 pounds, 120 kilos. That's insane. Roberto's like 210 pounds. He's like 215, maybe 220. And if, it, and if he is 220, it's he, when he's full. You know, he, he doesn't look like a super huge dude. He's actually kind of slender, but his body's big. Like, if you see Roberto in person, he's got this big shoulders, big chest, uh, big back, and then, like, slender arms and slender legs. It's an interesting build, but he, he's very, very, very technical and uh, has got a gas tank that's unlimited. And his ability to take the back and force positions to take the back was on full display. Uh, submits Eli Braz in the final, but he was actually the only athlete from Team Kasai to not get a submission, and I believe it was on day two. But <laughs> he, he fought um, Adam. I forgot uh, Adam who. But he fought, a, he fought a competitor from Team Anginos, and he uh, <laughs> he won each round because Aiga is three five-minute rounds per matchup, which I actually like that format as well because then you don't know who you don't have to wonder who's winning. It's a, if it's a draw, 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 then it's a ref's decision, but you know, you have it across three rounds. So it increases the, the dynamic a little bit, which I really appreciate. Um, but Roberto uh, ended up winning that fight by about, th I think he racked about 30 points. So it's still a dominant, completely dominant performance. Uh, I don't know that Team Kasai got scored on. I think they might have maybe once, but I'm not really sure. All I know is they looked freaking fantastic. It was it was a crazy show. Twenty fight or 21 fights and 20 submissions. 21 fights, 21 wins. Not a single match dropped the entire day. Uh, we thought Euro Trash's performance at Aiga Turkey was dominant, and we're like, whoa, that was crazy. Team Kasai looked like the only team in the tournament, and that's no disrespect to the other teams. It was just their day. And also, I think even on a bad day for them, it still would have been really good because, I mean, these competitors were just insane at the qualifiers in Brazil. So we'll see them in the group stage in Kazakhstan in 2025. I'm very excited about that. Now, uh, moving on, coming up for me is the IBJJF World Championship uh, this weekend, June 1st and 2nd. I'll be commentating alongside Daniel O'Donnell once again. Uh, I believe it's a two-day event on Flow Grappling. I believe I'll be commentating two days for it. Not sure because I thought I was going to commentate two days for uh, the West Coast Trials as well, but that ended up not happening. So I guess I'll find out when I get there. But I'm going to be traveling out this Thursday night with my wife and child. We're going to spend some time and we're going to go on vacation, which is nice. Her birthday's on Monday. So, you know, I'll be able to treat her to some some nice uh, long beach food and good times, maybe the beach. We'll see. Uh, then after that, uh, June 15th is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 17. I will return as a play-by-play -play commentator for that. That will be awesome. I'm glad that I'm invited back to that stage to, uh, you know, just be a part of that. Then after that, I'm still waiting to hear back about shows on June 29th. But June 20th, I will be, in leading up to June 20th and coming back, I will be you know, pretty inactive. I'm going to go on vacation. So my wife and I will actually get like, you know, kind of two weekends to travel and, and do some nice stuff together. But then uh, the USA qualifiers for Aiga, I don't know if I mentioned that this episode or not, but they will be the next qualifiers. They will be later this year, I believe October. Then December, be in Thailand. And then after the four qualifiers, you guys can look forward to uh, the Aiga uh, Champions League group stage tournament, which will be 
three separate occasions in Kazakhstan over the period of six months. So two months, two months, two months. That would be very, very cool. Work has been ramping up. Time, uh, you know, commentating all these events has been ramping up, and it has been uh, very, very cool. Uh, I'm very privileged. I'm very tired. I'm going to make some adjustments here at home on, you know, different things that I can do to have some more time with my family, have some more time at home, have some more time to train. Uh, I'm currently talking about different opportunities in uh, different promotions about potentially stepping into other areas of combat sports. We'll see. I'm not talking about MMA. Um, but I'll give you guys updates as it progresses. I'm, I'm in the beginning stages of talks right now. I hope to leverage that into more opportunities. But one last thing I'd like to uh, talk about is this right here. So prayer on the steps at the Walter Pyramid. This is going to take place at the 2024 IBJJF Worlds. Uh, I'll be one of the, you know, kind of, I guess, speakers, but also I'll be uh, delivering a prayer. And uh, Marcio Jeos is going to be uh, the one leading the prayer in Portuguese, but we want to do this in some of the big tournaments. I'm, I'm collaborating with East LA Jiu-Jitsu and Ron Mackay, as well as some other people in the community. Uh, Jesus and Jiu-Jitsu, I believe, is also one of the people that are going to be a part of it. Um, but, you know, just just really, really excited for the direction that God is taking this, and for those of you guys who are Christians and watching this, just be there. Uh, Friday, May 31st, 12 o'clock noon. If you guys need prayer for anything, uh, aside, this is supposed to be just like a way to just love on people and to, uh, you know, man, just just do what I what we are really sure God wants out of the jiu-jitsu community, and that is for people to uh, really see the gospel. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the direction everything's going. This has been another episode of the Open Guard Cast. Uh, make sure you guys follow at Jake Watson Media on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe if you guys like the content. And if you don't, I am so sorry. No, I'm not. I Well, maybe I am. I don't know. But we'll see. This is another episode. Uh, we'll be back probably later this week with another one uh, previewing IBJJF Worlds. I might have Danny O'Donnell as a guest. We'll see. I actually would really like that. I would actually. Man, that's a good idea. I'm going to text him. He's a friend of mine. Anyway, love you guys. God bless you. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Open Guard Cast. <laughs>